Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices across film, television, and theater. And I'm so thrilled today to be joined by the fantastic producer, Monica Levinson, who has the most incredible array of films that she's produced over the years. And currently at the moment alone has Borat's subsequent movie film, The Trial of Chicago 7, The Waterman, and Wonder Darkly, as well as having produced Women in Film Make It Work recently as a television special for the CW. And, and one of the things I was really fascinated about in, in your role as a producer is, is your selection of, of projects. Because when you come onto a project, you don't know if it's gonna be six months to a year to you know a five to 10 year process in terms of how long it's gonna get made because things get greenlit, things get financed, things fall apart, casting falls apart all the time. And so beyond looking at the script and, and the director that you're going to be working with, what are some of the other details that are really important for you to know going into a project before you decide if it's something that you really want to put that much potential time from your life into it? Wow. Well, first off, thanks for having me and reeling off all that stuff, reminding me of what my year was last year um, and, and to come, actually, because The Waterman comes out this spring. Um, but, you know, I just... I like what I like, you know, I mean, obviously I have a very wide range of earnest projects and, you know, uh, R-rated comedies and um, historical fiction and historical um, nonfiction, you know, so there's, uh, it's not really, not historical nonfiction, but you know what I mean? I mean, telling true stories. I have an array of um, tastes like everybody, you know, we all like to sit down and watch a comedy sometimes. And sometimes we like to watch a drama, um, or a thriller. So that's really, for me, uh, I pick it just by, if I, if I respond to it, if I like it and I respond to it and I want to watch that movie, then that, or that television show, then that's how I become attached yeah. or, you know, that's how I, um, decide that I want to become attached. Yeah. And I wanted to talk a little bit about your relationship with Sasha Baron Cohen, who you've worked on several projects with, because you worked on the original Borat film as well. And then Bruno, in what was originally supposed to be a few months of collaborating together and turned into about five years of making those two films. And when you think about them on paper, fundamentally, people could look at those two films and think that the process behind the scenes was really the same. You know, it's this pseudo narrative slash documentary project, and he's pretending to be a character. But there were so many different details that went into the making of them, the types of participants that you were looking for, the way that you had to really think about the logistics behind the scenes. So what were those really massive differences between those two projects that, that really impacted the work that you were doing on them with him? Well, OK, so I, I met Sasha in 2004. Uh, and I was brought in by, uh, we had a different director at the time of the movie and a different producer. And I knew the producer and he brought me in and he said, it's going to be three months. Easy peasy. He'll be in and out. It's just this documentary style film. And um, I met Sasha and was a fan from the, you know, from before I met him because I loved the Ali G show. So I was really excited to go in there and work on that. And I had worked in TV news um, back in my first career a long time ago on Capitol Hill, actually, in, in D.C. And so this was a bit of a hybrid of my regular filmmaking experience and then also bringing in this sort of scrappy um, docu-style uh, filmmaking. So it all seemed to make sense to me very easily. And so going in and um, interviewing people, you know, because I had done that in an early career, that that just seemed like uh, second nature, I guess. And so it fit. It fit with what I wanted to do. And then, you know, between making Borat and Bruno, um, like you said, it was a five year experience. So I went in for three months and five years later, I, I finished that experience. And, um, it, you know, those two, I think you were asking about how those two films differ. Is that what you were yeah. asking? Yeah. I mean, they were oh, very much the same. And actually Bruno became a place, although we had a ton of law enforcement, um, engagement, if you will, during Borat. Um, I actually was in jail for 19 hours on Borat. I was arrested and put in jail for 19 hours along with um, our first AD. Uh, so, but we learned so much from that 
experience and from everything we did on Borat that we learned how, I mean, I obviously did nothing wrong and it was expunged, but they just wanted a collar. So we learned how to make sure to avoid getting anybody arrested in the future. And when we went to Bruno, people became, whereas Borat was sort of lovable in his anti-Semitic, racist, and, uh, you know, uh, you know, every way that he's not a character that you want actually to spend a lot of time with. He was really lovable in, a, in, in other ways. Um, Bruno was much more, he was just a more dangerous character when we would get out there. So we had law enforcement, but we actually had more troubles with our participants where, you know, we were constantly dealing with people with guns and we were dealing with um, angry people because homophobia was very real um, during the making of that movie. So it was a very different experience between the two because people seemed to enjoy Borat, um, but they really hated Bruno. Yeah. And in terms of, of the crew that you have, not just working on the project, but thinking about who's going to be on set, I wanted to talk about that a little bit because, you know, when you have these participants coming into spaces and essentially through his characters, he is allowing, you know, them to open up with things like homophobia and racism, and he needs them to feel comfortable with that. Is that really counterintuitive to the way that you really want to be putting together a crew for a project these days in having to think, you know, well, if we want this person who we know is really sexist and is going to lean into that through the way that Sasha can interview them, you know, obviously if we have a crew full of women on set, like that person's not going to say certain things. So how does that really impact the makeup of the crew or like how you think about who's going to be on set on specific days? Right. Well, I mean, listen, the, the crew that's going to be on set is very small. We don't have a big set. We don't have, you know, a ton of people there. We have, you know, two camera people, a sound person or three camera people, people and one sound or two sound people. So and mostly people are outside. So if there is a second sound person, they're maybe outside um, and they're not interacting with our guests. So, yes, we do have to cast those people that are in the room so that people feel free to express their viewpoints on who they really are and to be free and feel like they can speak um, in this environment. Uh, so yes, you know, a lot of white men in that one room, um, but then, you know, we had plenty of um, diversity in the office, in the hotel. Like when I, uh, I wasn't out on set on this latest movie, but, um, or I wasn't on the road, I should say, for the latest movie. I just went a couple times. But, um, you know, when I was, I was always back at the hotel. So nobody ever interacted with me. They wouldn't know who I was uh, or who the producer of the movie was. They ha would have no idea. So, uh, yeah, I mean, but yes, right there in that room, you have to make people feel comfortable to speak their mind and be honest. Yeah. I'm also so incredibly fascinated by the legal process that goes on behind the scenes on these movies, because every single time that, that Sasha has a project come out, there is always someone, at least one person that's going to try and sue him because they didn't like the way that they looked on camera, even though everything that they said is something that they actually said. Um, but no one's ever actually been successful. But I imagine that there's an incredible amount of of work that's going on behind the scenes to really kind of get ahead of that from a legal perspective and the contracts that are being drawn up and put together, appearance releases. So what does that what does that really look like behind the scenes in the work that you're having to do and working with legal counsel in a very different way to other projects? Well, I have to say that I was the one of my proudest days was when our lawyer basically said, you're you're essentially a de facto lawyer now, especially because I really wanted to go to law school. When I first got out of school, I thought that's what I want to do. And um, I figured that out quickly that that was not what I wanted to do. But um, yeah, I mean, it's a massive legal process. And we have this amazing lawyer named Russell Smith, who Sasha worked with on the Ali G show. And um, you know, he really trusts and he's part of the crew, basically, you know, we call him, he, his phone is always on. It doesn't matter where he is in the world. Um, and on throughout the years, he was in India part of the time he was on a completely different schedule, but he always answered his phone. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's about knowing the law. It's about making sure we don't cross, you know, step over the bounds of the law, um, and make sure we're always within our legal right to do what we're doing. And that's a different way of looking at filmmaking, but it also, um, 
And also just having the right of publicity and the right of privacy, knowing those laws, because I could really transfer that over to my regular filmmaking as well, because it makes me be able to take it to the lawyers and say, wait a second, I think we can do this if we do this, because the law says, and um, it's made me a stronger producer. Yeah. And I imagine that there must be a lot of kind of inadvertent hoops that you have to jump through in terms of the work that you're doing, even just with the crew that you're bringing on board to the project and vendors that you're working with because of the level of secrecy, you know, putting together a shell production company and really not being able to tell anybody what you're doing at any point. So how does that impact a lot of the work that you do because you're involved in so many of those aspects behind the scenes? Well, it is it is difficult. Everybody that I speak to gets an NDA before I even get on the phone. Um, I don't think I said the word Borat um, or the characters' names until you know, maybe we released the movie. I mean, I never would say it. I would never say the word, you know, because we had to keep it secret. And and it also made people wary of working with us, you know, at times where I'd say, well, I can't really tell you what the project is or, you know, I can't really explain why I need this, but I do. Um, but, you know, and and then you start working with trusted people over the years and, you know, we have really an amazing crew. We have an amazing group of vendors that we've worked with. Um, you know, the the studios over the time, you know, and Amazon was amazing. So we were able to start working with a bunch of people that we could actually be honest about what we were doing because they were part of the team. Yeah. And then on a different side of the spectrum, I wanted to talk a little bit about your work producing the trial of the Chicago seven with Aaron Sorkin, you know, because he's, you know, as a writer and as a filmmaker, he he comes in with such a specific vision and he's someone who really just knows exactly what it was that he, is that he wants from the project and, and individual scenes. So how did you feel that as a producer, you were able to come on board that project and, and really kind of best support the vision that he had in helping to actuate it? Well, actually on that one, the only way I really supported his vision was I read his script. Um, I thought it was incredible. Uh, I knew Sasha had been involved I don't know, 13 years earlier when we were in between Borat and Bruno, he was trying to figure out how to do Chicago 7. Spielberg was directing at the time. Um, and then as we were trying to figure out this movie, uh, Sasha said, you wouldn't believe this, but Chicago 7 is coming up again. And um, I really had nothing to do with it except to support it by, at the time I was working with Ship Hans Pictures um, and I was the president of production and I took it to Shivani Rawat, who's the uh, CEO and founder and uh, said, I really think this movie is amazing and the script is amazing and they need some final financing. And so that's where I came in. And that was sort of my, that was it for me um, and helped figure out how to get Sasha into doing both movies. That's all. So, yeah. But he's, I mean, it's a brilliant movie and I love it. And I'm so proud that I was able to help it get, into that, get it to that starting gate. Right. No, that's a hugely valuable contribution because like you said, it was in the making for, you know, over 13 years and had so many different moments where it was greenlit and was maybe going to happen and then didn't quite. Um, one of the things kind of looking at your career that I, I was also interested in general is just how much the type of film it is and the type of on-screen content it is, like what the impact is that that has on the work that you're doing as a producer. You know, if you look at Tara Mealy's Wonder Darkly, it's a very kind of like intimate two-hander. And that's obviously very different to projects that you've worked in, like Zoolander, which is, you know, a much wider cast and, and a broad comedy and what they need in terms of their set and, and the details that come together are very different. So how does that impact what you're doing in your role as a producer, if it does at all? I mean, it really doesn't. I'm, I'm here to be the person that makes sure that that vision gets onto the screen or wherever we're watching it now. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's always been my job. It's I started out um, as a young person working with my first job was with my first job in film was with Alan Pakula. So the director's vision was you know, key. It was a great time to come into the business and work with Bakula and Sidney Lumet and Michael Mann and really realize director's visions. So that's really how I was raised in the business. Um, so if, you know, Ben needs whatever on Zoolander, my job was to make sure that it happened and help that process. Um, same thing on Wander Darkly. Tara, you know, my favorite story of working with Tara is that our first meeting um, she came in and, and the script actually had already been written. Um, mostly we were still working on it a little bit, uh, when we met 
And she said, I know there's a scene with the dolphins and, uh, you know, I'm not sure. I, I've been told we can't afford it on our budget. And, um, but, you know, I'd really, and I just said, wait, the dolphins are what are the, it's a very magical part of the script. And I would hate to lose that. And I think that you need to keep it. And I, I know a guy that can find you dolphins. Like I, I've been out a ton of times out in the Santa Monica, you know, waters and seen many dolphins. So that became my mission, you know, like, okay, I know what I can bring that's very special to this project and make sure that we don't lose that special piece of the movie and make it a hike or whatever was, you know, being floated out there. So, um, yeah, you know, you just have to go and, and making a movie that's $6 million, uh, is really tough or five, whatever it was. Um, that's a really tough thing to do. And, um, so really we need all hands. You know, I worked with a lot of amazing women to pull that movie together and we all just pitched in. Um, but that's, that's, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm there to make sure that the movies happen and, or the projects happen and whatever that is, whether I have to be very hands-on. Um, and, you know, since I started in production and I understand line producing, um, if I have to jump in and help, on the smaller details, I do. If I can be more, you know, out here, big picture, um, I love doing that as well. Working with the cast, working with the director, working with my producing partners is just great. So I'm there to plug in where I need to be. And also I kind of, um, I like to be very, very involved. Like the Chicago 7 movie is very um, different than any other project I've ever worked on because I've never been sort of out there and just said, here you go, you know, <laughs> let's, let's move forward. I just like to be hands-on. So I think every project is pretty much the same in that way where I really try to jump in. Yeah. You know, and you were mentioning that you've also done work as line producing and you did a lot of UPM work in production prior to stepping into being a producer in your career. What were the really valuable tools that you got the opportunity to kind of like learn and, and develop his skill sets during that time that then once you took that step into producing you were like oh actually I didn't realize how useful this was going to be and what were the ways that when you first stepped into producing you also felt really pushed outside of your comfort zone and having to figure out and learn new things well you know it's interesting I worked with two amazing mentors one was Celia Costas who is a New York uh, line producer. She's amazing. And she really had me from the very start, had me work beside her um, and really did the job with her um, or, you know, made me feel like I was doing the job with her, you know, but she really, she was amazing and she helped me. And because she had worked with Pakula for so long and uh, Mike Nichols, she really did work as a producer, a line producer who understood the creative and work towards the creative. So that was always my training growing up. And then I worked with a man named Stuart Kornfeld, uh, who was Ben Stiller's producing partner. And he also had me work beside him and had me as his partner on, we did several movies together. And so I was trained to always um, be thinking about the creative and, and figuring out how to resolve any problems that we had fiscally and to be responsible, but do it in a way that was, um, you know, just always making sure that the vision was going to be there. So, uh, you know, did I have any discomfort? I, I think I was always doing that job. You know, I would always be whispering. I remember at one point I was sitting behind the monitor talking to uh, Stuart and giving him a note on something. And he goes, just tell the director. Why are you telling me? And I said, because it feels more right that I should tell you. And he's like, nope, you have the you have the right to go ahead and speak your mind now. You know, you've you've earned your stripes. Um, but that was while I was still line producing, and it really kind of gave me that boost to say, oh, I, I belong here. You know, and I think um, development was certainly one thing that I hadn't done as much of when I started to move into producing. So that's been really fun. And uh, at first I was nervous because I was like, oh, I don't speak the speak of development people. But ultimately I, I understood story and I, and I liked developing um, and didn't have to, you know, 
I, I, I learned quickly what those words were, the buzzwords, but it really didn't matter. I mean, it's just about telling a story. And um, so I had a lot of fun moving into that realm. Yeah. Well, with that journey of stepping into development and talking about the language of it as well, you know, it can also be a very sensitive process for writers as well. You know, this is something that they really thought about, that they thought about every day, sometimes for several years by the time you come into that part of the journey with them. So what have you found have been the best ways of, of communication where you're sharing notes and, and trying to give feedback and constructive criticism so that it doesn't feel personal and it feels like they'll be open to the conversation because there can be very different ways that those conversations can go. Absolutely. Um, listen, I try to be as honest as possible. Um, I don't know how to be any other way. Uh, it's just who I am. And so I'm honest, but I'm also understanding of what the story is and where they are in the process. Because also, uh, ultimately, I'm attracted to the material that they brought to the table. Or if they are writers that I respect that we've hired to put onto a project, you know, we've we've put them on the project because they have the same vision that we do moving forward. So I think any notes that I'm giving, any um, thoughts that I'm giving are to move towards the same goal. And so that's really how I'm looking at it because we've always been, you know, anybody that I'm working with is usually on the same, you know, we're all in the same um, path towards the same creative. So I don't think it's that, you know, I, I don't, again, I'm honest and I'm, you know, serving what both of our visions are. So I think it's okay, you know, to be honest with the notes. Yeah. And so much of your work as a producer is that you're the person that people look to when some so there's a fire that needs to be put out, whether it's something really small or it's something that's really big. And and, you know, there's certain things that you can plan for, but there's always going to be unexpected things. So what are some of the contingency plans and conversations that you like to have even before you're going into pre-production, just to preempt certain things that might come up to dissipate them before they even happen? Well, I love that, you know, having worked in independent film as well, I love the contingency. Like I love actually the money pot of a contingency because it's so necessary, you know, and I love, I always say to the line producers, we're not using the contingency because ultimately I always think that we're going to need it in post, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to need it for some visual effects or some work to remove the, you know, the camera person who's in reflection in the mirror or whatever it is. Um, we're going to need that money or to go and screen the movie. So um, I always find that that, bit of money is really something that should go into every project, every budget. And, you know, and I'm sure studios basically do that anyway. They have it in their own hidden budgets for, you know, for later. Um, but, you know, in terms of um, contingencies and dealing with problems, I'm just very straightforward with the, you know, with the production teams. I've always worked with I mean, I've been really lucky, you know, I've been really lucky. I've loved everybody that I've worked with. I, you know, even when there's been difficult projects, you know, those people remain my friends and, um, and great colleagues. And, you know, it's like with, with Sasha's movies, I mean, you couldn't get a better crew and, uh, you know, everybody says, oh, we're like family. Well, we really are close. You know, those people are some of my favorite people in the world uh, that I've worked with because we have been through the ringer together. And sometimes you just have to. Um, and as far as dealing with problems, you know, those movies, if anything, made me ready to pivot at any time and deal with a problem um, just as it comes. Yeah. I feel like pivot has been the most overused word of, of the yeah. last year since we went into this situation. And I want to talk a little bit about that because I think, you know, particularly in development, it's provided really unique dichotomy of the fact that all of a sudden everybody was available for meetings. You know, it was like, yeah, we can actually have that coffee meeting. We can jump on Zoom and, and schedules kind of really shifted a lot in those first few months specifically. And, and it seems like there was a lot more access 
for talent to have time to read scripts because they weren't on set shooting something for the next several weeks. And that was going to be the earliest they could look at anything. But at the same time, nobody wanted to move forward with anything because there was so much uncertainty as to like, is production coming back? When is it going to come back? So what did those first few months really look like? And, and what are some of the biggest changes that you felt that you had to make in terms of trying to make sure that your projects were still continuing to move forward against all of those roadblocks that all of a sudden became a huge part of our industry? Right. Well, I certainly had to, um, I mean, we were filming Borat, so we had to shut down and Sasha was, you know, rightly so. We all felt very strongly that the movie had to come out before the election. It was really important to us uh, to make sure that we were able to show the movie, um, especially because we really did feel like that's why we made it. Um, was to come out before the election and hopefully somebody would see it and maybe vote differently. Maybe. Uh, that's why we put please vote at the end of the movie. Um, so, you know, when we shut down, I started to get very nervous about timing and Sasha and I had, and Jason, our director, uh, we had many conversations about how we are going to uh, actually finish the movie in time. So my first three months were really learning everything I could about the virus, um, really figuring out how to do, how to shoot, safely shoot um, in the United States and abroad um, because we had to go to Romania. And, uh, you know, talking to every expert I, you know, I, I, I could think of. And Sasha found a connection to Johns Hopkins. And so we were speaking to them. We also had a private um, health management company on board who were giving, who was giving us as much information as we could about the virus and how to go safely about it. I also am part of a women's production society and we share information and it's women from every um, production company and uh, studio. And we were all talking about how to safely maneuver this uh, to get everybody back and working. So it was a lot of conversation. I was busier than I've ever been. And at the same time, I had posts going on on the Waterman. Um, and we were trying to figure out um, what we were doing with Wander Darkly because we had just premiered at Sundance. And so we were trying to figure out that sale. So it was a very, very busy time. And at the same time, my good friend Amy Bear, who is the board president of Women in Film, called me and said, you know, we can't do our gala this year. So would you do one of those virtual galas with me? And, and ultimately Stephanie, Elaine, um, Elaine Bray also joined us. And um, it was, that was also insane to try to do all of that at the same time, because that was a virtual uh, special that ended up being on the CW where we were um, amplifying the idea of hire her back, which is, you know, after a economic upheaval, women and pe people of color are sort of the worst hit um, and not necessarily hired back because they're usually the last to be hired. So the last to be um, hired back. And we were amplifying that to say hire more women, more people of color um, after, you know, when we rebuild the economy. So my first few months were insane. Um, and all the other projects, we were just sort of trying to figure out what was next and how we could make those during the pandemic. Um, and I think, you know, most of those have been going and moving forward. I have a, a project um, about Kent State that Jay Roach uh, is directing, Semi Chellis is the writer, and we're trying to figure out how to get that going. It's a limited series. Um, and so that's, uh, you know, that was something that was being written at the time and we just moved forward. Um, but yeah, it was just a very busy time. And uh, I think we used the time of being at home and being concentrated and being in these Zoom rooms to really have straight conversations with people. And, um, and yeah, a little bit of maneuvering, figuring out, I mean, with Borat, I actually, you know, one of the biggest things that we did, aside from getting out and shooting, because we realized that we were never going to make our release date um, if we didn't start, we started before anybody. Um, June 15th, we started, but we sent people up and started, you know, like made the decision about a month after shut, a shutdown, or maybe it was two months after shutdown. We were like, we need to go again um, and we need to pivot the story. 
you know, because we're documenting basically the year of 2020. So it was, um, it was crazy. And then during post, we couldn't screen the movie, which is how you really, you know, most comedies are screened many times for audiences. So we tried a couple of virtual screenings, but ultimately we went down to New Zealand virtually uh, and we had real screenings in New Zealand. We were zooming into the room so we could see audience reactions. We were recording it from there. We were real time giving, you know, for the Q&A. It was amazing. It was like really figuring out how to work in this space. So it was a big year. That's incredible to hear that you figured out a way to still have screenings to get that feedback. By going to New oh, it was great. It was so great. And New Zealand was a perfect place to go. I mean, we tried, we were going to Australia and then Australia shut down again. Um, and so we, you know, we just found audiences in New Zealand. It was wonderful. And they yeah. weren't asked and we could figure out what they were feeling. And although the audiences are slightly different, they're, you know, it's, it was really a, an amazing tool for us to get feedback. Yeah, that's so fantastic. And it's so incredible to hear how much everything still just kind of continues moving forward. And just with this array of projects that you have, I'm so excited to see what you have coming out in the next year even. Um, and thank you so much for taking time out of your day today to talk with us, Monica. Thank you, Mara. Nice meeting you.